Some people seem to believe that Christians think the Bible just dropped out of the sky one day, completely formed. But that's not at all what Christians think happened. Welcome back to part two in a series we're doing on the history of the Bible. It's a series that I decided to do because, well, every week I challenge people to read this book for themselves. And the reason I do that is because, simply put, this is easily the most influential book in the world. And it's my personal conviction that this book offers us the best possible opportunity to discover what it means to live an authentic human life. I know that a lot of people believe that this book is somehow out of touch. But I've got to tell you, I have never found better answers to the big questions of life than I have in the Bible. There's a good reason that people have risked their lives to smuggle this book into countries that banned it because of its contents and the way that it speaks about human dignity. This book creates a real problem for tyrannical regimes. I've met some of the people who put everything on the line back in the 20th century to make copies of the Bible on manual typewriters in the dead of night, carefully striking one key at a time so that the letters would push through five or six sheets of carbon paper. And of course, they had to find a place where nobody could actually hear them typing like that. I know of one person who placed pillows all around the typewriter to muffle the sound. And she knew full well that if she got caught, she'd be off to the gulag or worse. You and I have access to this incredible book because countless people have been willing to pay the ultimate price to be sure that you and I have it. And now we live in an age where we have more access than we ever have had before, thanks to digital forms of media. But sadly, at the same time, fewer and fewer people are actually reading the Bible. And what a tragedy, because I, I know full well that the Bible is not at all what the skeptics are telling you it is. I know what happens for people who take this book seriously. Look, I, I've lived with the Scriptures, and I've lived without the Scriptures, and I've got to tell you, there's no going back. And if this book is everything that it claims to be, well, obviously, you'd be a fool to ignore it. So where exactly did the Bible come from? Well, according to Paul, one of the most prolific authors in the Bible, this is a collection of writings that began with God Himself. Here's what he wrote in his second letter to Timothy. He said, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, a lot of Bible translations will say that the Scripture is inspired by God, which is why you'll hear Christians talking about the inspiration of the Bible. The word that Paul actually used in Greek is theopneustos, which literally means God breathed. So the version we just read is a good translation when it tells us that Scripture is breathed out by God. Peter describes that process like this. He says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the content of the Bible originates with God Himself, who inspired people to write out His thoughts. And as they did that, they often wrote those thoughts in their own words, which is why scholars can spot different writing styles throughout the Bible. And you'll notice, there are large portions of the Bible where the writer really is taking dictation from God, recording the words that God is speaking verbatim. But outside of those specific passages, the Bible writers communicated God's thoughts in their own language. In some cases, you'll find that God actually prepared these writers for the job even before they were born, like He did with the prophet Jeremiah. I mean, just listen to this at the head of Jeremiah's book. This is Jeremiah 1 and verse 4, and it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, what you and I call the Bible, this single volume bound between two covers, <laughs> 
Well, that single volume is a relatively recent invention because for the longest time, the Bible was really a collection of books, a collection of sacred writings contained in different scrolls. And it was only later on that we bound them together in book form, the form that you're used to, which scholars would call a codex. A, a codex is a book as we understand it, leaves of paper folded over and bound together. The codex was a huge technological advance over the scroll, which was kind of difficult to use because you sometimes had to unroll a lot of scroll before you could find the passage you were looking for. Notice the description of Jesus reading in the synagogue on Sabbath found on Luke chapter 4 where it says, And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And then Jesus goes on to read a portion from the book of Isaiah that actually predicts his messianic ministry. The codex, however, was a far more convenient way to preserve sacred writings. As opposed to the scroll, it was more portable and it was easy to navigate your way through it. In fact, most of the early Christian scripture collections were books about the size of a modern day paperback novel, about six inches high, so they were really easy to slip into your luggage. And once the printing press was invented more than a thousand years later, codices, that's the plural of codex, they became very easy to produce. The ancient Jews used scrolls to make copies of the Old Testament scriptures. Christians started to use codices or books just about from the beginning. From the second century onward, almost all Christian writings were produced in codex form. And a lot of these were actually collections of books, say, a few of Paul's letters bound together, or maybe just the four Gospels. But then as time moved along, we started to bind all of the sacred books together in a single volume, the way that you and I experience the Bible today. Although I've noticed a recent publication from one Bible publisher that has all the books as single volumes in a box set, and I'll admit that was more than I could resist, so I bought that one. Now, in, in this series, we're still going to have to eventually answer the question, how did we come to the decision that certain books were biblical and other books were not? Now, that's a much longer story than many people think because, well, the Bible didn't just drop out of the sky one day, fully formed, ready to go. The Bible was formed gradually over a period of about 1,500 years. The first five books date back to the time of Moses, and today we know them as the Torah or the Pentateuch. And they've pretty much always been considered canonical, which means we recognize them as being authoritative and inspired by God. They are pretty much universally recognized as Scripture. Now, we know for sure that while Moses likely authored the vast majority of those first five books of the Bible, he couldn't have written the very last part of Deuteronomy because, well, that describes his death and burial. Obviously, the Israelite community had someone complete the story by adding those last few verses. And traditionally, we think it was Joshua, Moses' successor. Which brings up a really important point. While God clearly used individuals to write the books of the Bible, the Bible is also the product of a community. It's divinely inspired, but at the same time, it has been somewhat shaped by communities of human beings who are being guided by the Holy Spirit of God. All right, it's time for a short commercial break, and I hope you'll take advantage of what the good folks at The Voice of Prophecy are about to show you. And I'll be right back after this. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers, but that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. Before the break, we were starting to talk about the Old Testament canon, and I mentioned how the scriptures were formed in a community of believers. God revealed Himself to a covenant people, and they were inspired to share His thoughts by committing them to paper, or to be more accurate, parchment. Parchment was actually made from animal hides, and when we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls in the middle of the 20th century, something like 90% of them were written on parchment or vellum. 
Normally, that kind of material wouldn't have survived that long because it's organic material. But these scrolls survived for thousands of years because they were placed in sealed clay jars in a very arid desert climate. So we kind of lucked out. And against all odds, we found them roughly 2,000 years after they were written. The books of Moses, or the Torah, were always regarded as sacred, and they had a special place in the tabernacle that marked them as being inspired by God Himself. Deuteronomy 31 tells us that these inspired books were actually kept inside the most holy place, the innermost compartment of the sanctuary. Some scholars think they were actually kept inside the Ark of the Covenant, while others, and people like me, believe they were kept by the side of the Ark. This all happened at a time when God was visibly present with His people, leading them across the wilderness as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. When the children of Israel pitched their camp, that cloud would descend into the most holy place where the presence of God would literally dwell between the cherubim on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. From that spot, God would communicate with Moses, and Moses recorded the evergreen material, the stuff that would affect every generation in the books of the law, or the Torah, as it's come to be known. In addition to the Torah, the Hebrew Scriptures also include the prophets and the writings. So now we have three divisions of Scripture, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. In Hebrew, these three divisions are called the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. When you take the first syllable of all three words and you mash them together, you get the word Tanakh, which eventually became shorthand for the entire Hebrew Bible. Now, if you pick up a copy of the Hebrew Scriptures like, like this one, Christians will find something really interesting in the table of contents. This has all the same books as the Christian Old Testament, but they're arranged in a different order. In later years, Christians rearranged the books in order to have the prophetic books like Micah and Malachi come right before Matthew's Gospel. So it would be obvious to the readers that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Messianic promise. But the Jewish scriptures arranged them quite differently, so that Ezra and Nehemiah come near the end, and the final word in this entire book is 1st and 2nd Chronicles. That way, the scriptures end with the sack of Jerusalem, the story of the Babylonian captivity, and then a very brief mention of the Persian general Cyrus, who liberated the Jews and allowed them to go home to rebuild the holy city and the temple. Now, obviously, those parts of the story were written after the Babylonian captivity, and so you can see that the process of putting together a collection of authoritative holy books actually took a lot of generations. Now, some scholars dispute what I'm about to say, and with good reason. But a lot of people believe that the Hebrew canon was finalized at the Rabbinic Council at Jamnia near the end of the first century, in about A.D. 90, after the destruction of the Second Temple. The theory suggests that this happened as a response to the appearance of a brand new Jewish offshoot, which was the Christians. Suddenly, they needed to define what constituted real Jewish belief in very definitive terms, so they produced the Old Testament canon. But in recent years, this theory has lost some ground, and the famous 20th century Bible scholar F. F. Bruce has said that it is probably unwise to talk as if there were a council or synod of Jamnia which laid down the limits of the Old Testament canon. But still, I want to draw your attention to this idea because it highlights something important. If that council really did finalize a list of canonical books, they weren't creating a canon. They were recognizing something that already existed. And that's a really important distinction, because the way that secular historians tell the story of Christianity, they say it was the faith community, the church, who created the Bible without any need for God to intervene at all. In other words, according to those folks, the Bible is a purely human document, and it only became authoritative because we decided it was. But among people of faith, including me, we recognize that God inspired these books, and then we recognize those inspired books in a finalized canonical list. In other words, we didn't invent the New Testament, we recognized it. Of course, getting back to the Hebrew canon, it was really important to make a distinction between inspired and non-inspired books because the 39 books of the Old Testament were by no means the only treasured writings of the day. There were other books, like 
1st and 2nd Maccabees, which told the story of Israel's deliverance from Greek oppression. And we had other important documents as well. They were very important books, and I honestly believe everybody probably should read them because of the historical context they give for the Scriptures. But these books were never recognized as divinely inspired. Why? Well, for starters, they were written in Greek, and the Jews rejected the notion that God could inspire books in anything but the Hebrew language. But there were other issues as well. The books of the Maccabees were simply written too late to be considered Scripture. Other non-inspired historical books largely had the same problem, and Christians have noticed that Jesus never ever quoted from any of these apocryphal writings. That's probably because in places they openly contradict the teachings of the well-established scriptural books. In modern times there are Christian traditions that have reintroduced these apocryphal books into the Old Testament, but it's important to note that the Jews never accepted any of these as scripture. I remember as a, a new believer being confused about all these extra books and portions of books that appeared in some editions of the Bible, and I was curious to know if maybe Protestants hadn't made a mistake by not accepting these books. Fortunately, though, I'm a pretty avid reader, and I read through the works of the famous Jewish historian Josephus really early on. Josephus was born at about the time when the early Christian church was making its presence felt. And at one point, he provides us with a list of the books the Jews considered authoritative. Here's what he said. For we have not an innumerable multitude of books among us, disagreeing from and contradicting one another as the Greeks have, but only twenty-two books, which contain the records of all the past times, which are justly believed to be divine. And of them five belong to Moses, which contain his laws and the traditions of the origin of mankind till his death." Now, of course, the Hebrew Bible that we have is 39 books, and Josephus only mentioned 22. That's because back in his day, some of the books were combined with each other, like First and Second Chronicles. Lamentations and Jeremiah were lumped together, and so were Judges and Ruth. It's exactly the same material as the 39 books that we have in the Old Testament, just arranged a little differently. But the fact is, the Hebrew community never accepted the apocryphal books as divinely inspired. Important? Sure. Informative and inspiration null? Yeah, absolutely. But they were never considered to be a part of the inspired scriptures. And honestly, nobody really did until the Council of Trent in the 16th century, when the Church of Rome included these apocryphal writings in order to defend ideas that the Protestants were disputing, like the doctrine of purgatory. And at some point, we'll get to that story as well. But right now it's time for another quick break, so I'll be right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. And we're back, and today we're doing part of a series on the origins of the Bible. And I think there's probably a pretty good chance I'm going to skip around through history a little bit, sometimes looking at the earliest formation of the canon, and other times exploring the story of various Bibles that had a real impact on the Christian community. So I'm hoping you'll be patient with me if we kind of do things out of order sometimes. In fact, knowing me, there's a good chance we'll even drop the series at some point and then come back to it in the future. One of the big ideas that's important to understand is that the creation of the Bible was a collaborative effort. It all began with God. He inspired the prophets to convey His thoughts to the people, thoughts that had universal application and would prove to be important to every generation of believers. What that means is that there was human agency in the creation of the Scriptures. The Church didn't invent the Bible the way that some secular scholars suggest. We merely recognized it. Among our Jewish cousins, there was a sizable effort to keep the Scriptures intact from generation to generation. They went out of their way to prevent tampering or even simple copy mistakes. When you look at some of the older scrolls, you'll find a note at the end of each book. 
Sometimes listing the number of words that are supposed to be in that book, or maybe mentioning the word that's supposed to be in the very middle of the book, so that readers can check the copyist's work. The scribes who produced copy after copy of these important books knew that this book was the voice of God, and even one tiny mistake could change the meaning of an entire verse. Jesus kind of referred to that level of vigilance when he told his disciples that the moral law of God is permanent. You might remember that he said, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now, the iota and the dot were tiny little markings made by scribes, and they represented the finer details of the text. Jesus said that those could never be changed, and it kind of reminds us of the incredible care that the covenant community took when it came to preserving those sacred texts. If you made a mistake in the small stuff, you might inadvertently change the meaning of an entire sentence, and they knew that must never be allowed to happen. Now, that doesn't mean the scribes never ever made a mistake because, well, they did. We know they did. But fortunately, the Jewish community was incredibly careful. And because we have so much manuscript evidence, any mistakes that made it into the various manuscripts are actually really easy to spot. And when we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls back in the 1940s, we also found the entire book of Isaiah. And much to the skeptic surprise, the book of Isaiah that we have today is virtually identical to the ancient copy we found in a cave. In other words, the text has been faithfully preserved, thanks to the diligence of scribes who knew they were handling the Word of God. Now, that's hardly doing justice to the birth of the Old Testament canon, because there are all kinds of fascinating stories about the people who preserved these important books. But what I'm trying to accomplish with this series is just a really quick overview, and eventually we'll talk about the birth of the New Testament canon as well. And we're going to spend more time talking about that because the New Testament actually has a lot more detractors. The canon of the Old Testament is pretty much settled in the minds of most people, but in recent years, the canon of the New Testament has been coming under fire. You'll remember that in our last episode, we touched on the historical fiction of Dan Brown, who suggested that the Council of Nicaea actually chose the four Gospels that we have today. Even secular historians know that Dan Brown made that up, or at least he was repeating really sketchy conspiracy theories. But still, there are more questions we should probably examine, like the reappearance of the so-called Gnostic Gospels in the 20th century, books like the Gospel of Thomas. There are people who would like you to believe that those books were suppressed by the church for political reasons, and so in time on some show, we'll probably take a closer look at that. But for now, I just want to underline one really important idea. The scriptures were born in a faith community. They did not appear in isolation. They didn't drop out of the sky. They were produced by a covenant community of God's people who were inspired by God Himself to write these documents. So the Bible, in some ways, is just a little bit like Jesus Himself. The Bible calls Christ the Word, and of course we also call the Bible God's Word. Jesus was fully human and fully divine at the very same time, and it turns out that's the case with the Bible as well. It's an infallible document, which means that it's never wrong. But at the same time, it's a very human document, which only makes sense because, well, it was penned by human beings, inspired by God to write it. You, you can see their personalities, their individual writing styles shining through the text. But that doesn't make the Bible a purely human document. And this is where I part company with secular historians. The Bible was produced in a community, but not really by that community. And that's a really important concept because, well, it actually explains one of the key differences between the way that Roman Catholic and Protestant Christians understand the origin and the role of the Scriptures. All right, it's time for one last quick break, but I'll be right back after this to wrap things up. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. 
If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. Fortunately, there's not much doubt about the Old Testament books that the Jews considered to be holy. Their list of canonical books was settled by the time the Christian church was born. And what you'll find in the New Testament is an awful lot of reverence for those Old Testament scriptures. Jesus quoted from them regularly and even told us that, quote, Scripture cannot be broken. And when you get to the book of Acts, you find the disciples preaching from the Old Testament in order to demonstrate that Jesus really was the fulfillment of Messianic prophecy. And of course, Paul's letters do the same. They repeatedly quote the Old Testament. He builds his arguments on the authority of those Hebrew scriptures. Now, of course, our Jewish cousins wouldn't call it the Old Testament, but just the Scriptures, because, well, they don't acknowledge the New Testament. In recent years, there's been this half-hearted attempt to rename the Old Testament to recognize that fact. So, some people have taken to calling it the First Testament instead. But the habits of many centuries are really hard to change, so that never really took root. Today, some Christians assume that we call it the Old Testament because it's somehow defunct, and they treat it like an old car or an old sweater as if it's time to throw it away. But it's really important to understand how that terminology was born. It wasn't talking about the book itself, it was talking about the covenant. In the first 39 books of the Bible, we have God making a covenant with His chosen people. And of course, as fallen human beings, they actually failed to live up to that. Then in the New Covenant, Jesus becomes one of us and keeps our end of the bargain for us. It's still the same covenant, but now God Himself has kept both sides of the agreement, His side and ours. As the New Testament church began to write what they knew about Christ, their writings quickly became very important to the early believers. In fact, at one point, the Apostle Peter even calls Paul's writings Scripture when he complained that they were really hard to understand. You'll find that in 2 Peter 3, where Peter tells the believers that false teachers were twisting Paul's writings like they were twisting other scriptures. This appears to contradict some modern scholars who say the church came up with the idea of a New Testament canon hundreds of years after Christ. But the internal evidence that we actually find in these writings suggests pretty strongly that the church recognized the New Testament as it was being written. And now, I'm completely out of time. But before I sign off, let me encourage you to head on over to BibleStudies.com where you'll find all the material you need to really ground yourself in the Bible and begin to understand it. We've got courses that will carry you through all the major themes of Scripture, as well as courses that focus on prophecy like Daniel or Revelation. And you can't beat the price because generous donors have made this available to you. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Sean Boonstra, and this has been another episode of Authentic. Hey, thanks for watching Authentic. Would you be willing to do me a favor? Like, subscribe, and drop a comment. That really does help the algorithm put Authentic in front of more people, and it's free. So go ahead, like, subscribe, and comment. Thank you.